cover in Philippians chapter 3. So as you grab your cup of coffee and you get your Bibles out and your pencils or pens or your iPad or whatever it is that you're going to take notes, let's just go ahead and go before the Lord and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. God, your word is our life. It's our lifeline, especially during these times where we're isolated and, and all the uncertainty that's going around um, in this world, Lord. We thank you that we have your more sure word to get us through as an anchor for our soul. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, not only for the Apostle Paul, who is able to share his life with us, but God, how that encourages us that no matter what comes our way, God, that you are faithful and Lord, you will see us through. So God, we just pray that your spirit would be poured out among us, Lord, in us, through us, and let it spill over to those that are around us. So God, just do that this morning as we open your word. We pray that your word would sink deep, that God, it wouldn't just be another Bible study or just another thing that we could take notes on, but Lord, it would be life-changing. God, that you would speak to our hearts by the power of your spirit. So God, we just give this time to you. We thank you and we praise you that even though we're at home, we can still open our word and we can still fellowship one with another through your word. So God, we just thank you and praise you and we give this time to you for your perfect will to be done, for your voice to be heard in Jesus Christ's most precious name. And all God's ladies say, amen. Well, again, today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3. I'm sorry if we seem a little, or I seem a little uh, crazy, but I just found out yesterday, kind of afternoon, as far as when I started studying, that I was going to be teaching today. But it is really good to be back. Um, it's been a while because we've had the different teachers, but I know you guys have been so blessed. I've been blessed as I've tuned in. Uh, our family is in a crazy time. My son had... Uh, back surgery and we've been uh, watching him go through his healing time coming out of the hospital and I want to thank you for those who have been praying for him he's still in a lot of pain so if you would keep praying for him that would be a blessing but we're going to get through this and a uh, great time to be uh, isolated anyway so uh, with all of that being said we're all well as far as being sick so praise God for that and I pray that you guys are all well uh, also. Well, again, Philippians 3, lesson 4. We have looked so far as uh, the overview of Philippians with Emily. She did a fantastic job giving us that flyover picture of what Philippians is all about. And in chapter 1, we looked at how it was joy and suffering. Melissa explained how Paul taught that things happened to him, both good and bad, but they were all for, to further the gospel. As he concluded, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And But he was hard-pressed between the two, which shows me that it was actually a sacrifice for him to continue living. Because he far wanted to be more with Jesus than to have to live through the trials of this world. Can anybody relate to that? I know I can. It sounds so good to be in glory right now. But, but God has a purpose, and that is for us to further the gospel. Well, in chapter 2, we looked at how it is revolving around joy and serving. We learned that serving others is to display the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, as we do all things without murmuring or complaining. We saw that Christy talked about how this is the opposite of hoarding toilet paper. And I loved that because you go in the store and everybody is out for themselves. They don't care that we've got the most vulnerable in society that is doing without. And we've got pantries full of things and so that is the opposite of the mind of Christ the mind of Christ is to give to others and put one another before ourself but as God works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure it will result in us looking out for the needs of others the mind of Christ well today in chapter 3 we see joy in believing as the church at Philippi was in danger 
they were being pulled away from the grace of God for salvation. So Philippians 3 serves, serves as a warning against the influence of self-righteous, pharisaical living. But it also is a warning against licentious living, of just throwing the word, out, word of God out the window and saying, I can do whatever I want. And Paul knew firsthand the futility of a relationship with God based on that outward uh, ritual. In fact, he was uh, very familiar with all of the writings that Jesus, when he addressed the religious leaders in Matthew 23, 24, Jesus called the Pharisees blind guides. He said in Matthew 23, 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Verse 26, blind Pharisee. First cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that, you, that the outside may be clean also. He said, you are like whitewashed tombs. Those are some pretty descriptive words, which would indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Verse 28, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawless. You know, we can put on a really good act of being so self-righteous or so holy, and we can appear to men to be a certain way, but you know, God sees the heart. And that's what Paul wants to get to. He says that we are saved by grace through faith and, and not of ourselves. And that is the point of Philippians chapter 3. So verse 1 of Philippians 3, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, he's changing over to a new section, rejoice in the Lord. And I love that in all that Paul was going through, in fact, none of us probably will ever go through everything that Paul went through, yet his overall theme of Philippians while he's in prison is to rejoice. How many of us feel like we're imprisoned at home right now? And are we rejoicing? Are we serving our family members? Or are we complaining and being distracted from the word of God? We have such an opportunity to sink deep into the Lord. And for that reason alone, we can rejoice. And it gives us hope because in our difficult times, like Paul, we can have that attitude. And then he goes on to say, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious. And I thought it was funny that this word actually means irksome. It's not irksome. It doesn't irk me to tell you the same things over and over again, although sometimes you feel like that. But for you, it's safe. Or this word means that it will make you secure. So Paul wasn't bothered by going over the same things over and over again. Because he knew for God's people, it would make them secure. And that's what God's word does, is it secures us. As I said, it anchors us into the Holy of Holies. So ultimately, Paul's reminding us that going to heaven is based on the righteousness of Christ through a relationship with him. It's not based on the righteousness of man, because that would be religion. And religious, religion saves no one. Well, then in verse 2, Paul uses three terms as he warns the church. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the mutilation. The first term, dogs, that Paul uses would have hit home to the Jews because it was loaded with derogatory meaning. It was a term of contempt against the Gentiles. There was no lower term that you could use if you called someone something. And then if that weren't enough, number two, he calls them evil workers. Evil because that is what legalism does. It's an enemy of the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. It's uh, got the focus on the outward accomplishments and appearances uh, rather than the inward heart of God. It emphasizes righteousness being earned by good works, as we just saw. And then the third term he used is speaking is the mutilation, which is speaking of those who put that emphasis on the outward external circumcision. 
in order to obtain a right standing with God. You see, many Jewish people took pride in those outward rituals, thinking somehow it made them superior to the Gentiles who came to Jesus by simple childlike faith. But here Paul's letting them know that God's more interested in that inward heart than the outward display. And while they didn't deny Jesus or they didn't deny the gospel of salvation, they were adding to it by insisting that the converts could only come to the fullness of the gospel through the law of Moses. It was like Jesus plus. And then in verse 3, he talks about the spirit in contrast to the works of the flesh, saying, for we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. Aren't you glad that we can just take a step back and allow the spirit to come upon us? And it's not about us, but it's about God through us. Now to worship God in spirit means we don't need a stone altar. We don't need a certain place or any type of ritual to worship our Jesus. In fact, speaking to the woman at the well, you guys are all familiar with it. In John 4, 23, Jesus said, but the hour is coming and now is when a true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. He's calling us to worship him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit of tru- and truth. So worship is not based on circumcision or any other external ritual. It's based only on the spirit of the living God through an internal attitude of the heart. And true worshipers also in verse 3 of Philippians 3 rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So as we look at joy in believing, joy through faith, Paul emphasizes rejoicing in Jesus and his righteousness because it's impossible for us to be righteous apart from Jesus. In fact, Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. But, but as we abide in Jesus and we realize that his name is Jehovah Tzekenu, meaning that the Lord, he is our righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it tells us that he made him, he made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's amazing. Oh, the provision that Jesus has given to those who will call upon his name. But then in verse four, Paul goes on. Not to brag, but to let the religious leaders know that he fully understood what it meant to have earthly accomplishments saying in verse 4, though I almost, I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And in verse 5, he said he was circumcised the eighth day. Now, this was a ritual that began to set Abraham apart from the Gentiles, and he was set apart through the cutting away of flesh in Genesis chapter 17. But the point is, this was after Abraham was made righteous by faith in Genesis 15. Paul said he was the stock of Israel. And this meant that he was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, he was an heir of God's covenant. He was also of the tribe of Benjamin, which was the 12th and final son of Jacob. This is the tribe where Saul who was the first king of Israel, came. He was also a Hebrew of the Hebrews, which indicated he was not Hellenistic. A lot of the Jews started uh, adapting to the, the Greek culture, becoming Hellenistic Jews. 
Paul said, I didn't have any part of that. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He never adopted the Greek culture, but instead rejected the Gentile way of living and he, uh, that a lot of others were embracing. He had the best Hebrew education that there was as he sat under Gamaliel, being the most respected rabbi of the time. He was very well schooled in Hebrew. And then he, concerning the law, he said, a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees believed in the Old Testament. They re believed in the resurrection. They believed in the spirit beings and angels. And it was a high honor to be a Pharisee as there were only 6,000 Pharisees allowed at one particular time. They were separated. They, that's what the word Pharisee means, from the common people. So it was an elite sect that was jealous or zealous about upholding every letter of the law. But unfortunately, they were also known for being self-righteous and prideful. And, and they were so separated from the common people that they would have nothing to do with them. And we see that as we saw Jesus address the Pharisees, we know that he does several times throughout the New Testament. And they were, it was never in a favorable way. One of my favorite parables that Jesus taught was in, is found in Luke 18, 10, is it addresses the difference between the commoner and the Pharisee. In Luke 18, 10, it says that two men went up to the temple to pray, a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And in verse 11, it says that the Pharisee stood off and prayed thus to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like these other men extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And he lists all his wonderful accomplishments in the flesh. But verse 13, the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. But he beats beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, he had the right perspective. He knew that there was no good that was in him. And he needed the mercy of Jesus Christ. And in verse 14, Jesus said, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other, speaking of the Pharisee, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, Paul understood because he had been on both sides. He was a prideful Pharisee until God knocked him off that horse on the way to Damascus. But now, as he was blind and now he sees, he was a humble bond servant. Well, then in verse six, Paul continues and he said, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. He was so totally committed to Judaism to the point that he imprisoned and even murdered Christians. It is thought that he was present at Stephen's stoning as they killed Stephen for his faith in Jesus Christ. You can read about uh, his persecution in Acts 22. But because he perceived that they were teaching heresy, pulling people away from his beloved Judaism, his zeal was not according to knowledge. Okay, and you can read about that in Romans 10 too, that describes that kind of zeal. And then it says concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless, Paul said. And unfortunately, his righteousness was being measured uh, against other people around him. It was not being measured against God's righteousness. You see, his blamelessness was based on the fact that he attended synagogue. He attended all the feasts that were mandatory in Judaism, all the rituals that were commanded by the law. Paul did it. He checked off everything on his list, meaning that he was blameless. So if anyone could brag about being religious or having confidence in flesh, it would have been Paul. In fact, the, Paul, the false teachers he was speaking of would have loved to have had Paul's credentials. But in verse 7, he says, What things were to gain, gain to me, everything that he listed, 
all that he had once put his trust in, these I have counted loss for Christ. Loss because Paul once thought all these things made him acceptable before God. But now he realizes that they were nothing and that there is nothing that we can do this side of heaven that will earn or make us right with God. Not only that, but remember, he's in a Roman prison and not one single aspect of his pedigree is going to save him. Only Jesus Christ can save him. So he continues in verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for in comparison to the excellent excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. This word rubbish carries the idea of the most vile, rotten trash that you could have. That is all of those good things that he got in this world. All of his credentials were vile in comparison to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He gave him up so that I may gain Christ. The grammar indicates that he continued to count anything in this world as rubbish. And as I thought about that, I thought how easy it is for us to get puffed up in the little offering that we have to give. When somebody comes to us and says, oh man, that blessed me. You're awesome. It's like, it's so easy to go, yeah, I know. God's just gifted us in this area. I I know how to sew really well so I can do all of this stuff or I I can do um, you know I, I know the Bible so I can do this or whatever it is it's not to point anything out but whatever it is it's so easy for the enemy to come in and allow us to get puffed up when we know that it's only God working in and through us. And here Paul is constantly counting all of his accomplishments as rubbish because he knows that there is nothing good in any of us. And the only good that comes from us is the glory of Jesus Christ working in and through us. And I praise God for that because none of us has it all together. We're just a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners that Jesus Christ has chosen and he wants to use us. And we'll look at that more in a minute. Verse 9. His goal was to fully know Christ, to gain Christ, and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So Paul's showing the vast difference between duty and desire. He's showing the contrast between self-righteousness that comes from good works with a relationship based on Jesus Christ's righteousness by faith. And, and the difference is the works that I have to do as a duty opposed to the works that I get to do that just flows through me. I don't even realize I'm doing them. And then in verse 10, he continues. Remember, this would have been foreign with those who were focused on works or performance, as Paul says, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, speaking of the power of his re resurrection, it's not talking about when we're resurrected. It's speaking of the here and now, that we can know the power of his resurrection in our life even today. We can experience that power. And then he goes on and says, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, which is speaking of the future hope at the rapture of the church, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. So to know him in this way is not speaking of knowing doctrine or memorizing scripture or history, but it's to know him of course, according to the word of God, but to know his presence in our life as we walk with him and talk with him. And while it's easy to say, I want to know Jesus, especially wanting to know that resurrection power in our life today, we have to realize that before we can know that resurrection power, we must experience the fellowship of his sufferings and, that, and that's what it means to be conformed to his death. You know, we've got Easter coming up this weekend. 
And we see what his death entailed. We see what that being conformed to his death would mean for you and I. Jesus Christ died a selfless, sacrificial death. He was the sinless Lamb of God who took away our sins, the sins of the world. He was others focused. And so to be conformed to his death means we are to die to self, to present our bodies that living sacrifice. But praise God, we've seen it doesn't have to be something that we work up. It's a matter of us abiding in Christ because it is God who works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So it's by the grace of God that we put others first before ourselves, not something that comes natural. And, and I'm sure that we all understand that as we're kind of have this stay at home order where we're having to serve others and we can get on each other's nerves but we have to take that step back and say, God, give us your mind. Let me praise you that I have to clean up after my children. Let me praise you that I have to do dishes again. I mean, that comes with eating, I guess. Now I have to cook and then I do the dishes and then I cook all over again. It seems like that's all we're doing is laundry, dishes, and cooking, right? Am I the only one? But we can praise God in that because we're putting others first before ourself and instead of murmuring and grumbling we can rejoice in the fact that we have someone with us so it doesn't come natural but it does come as we abide and we put on the mind of christ so paul trades all the riches of the world all the notoriety of man for a personal relationship with jesus and he joyfully accepts the loss of all things and the comparison can't be missed as mark 836 asks for what profit will it will what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but yet loses his soul what profit would it be for us to be comfortable but not be able to partake in that resurrection power it's a matter of dying to self we're uncomfortable but we get to experience his resurrection power now as a side note it's not that the, the things that Paul listed were bad or wrong. It doesn't mean that we today can't pursue a degree or a career or we can't pursue things that the world esteems highly. But it is that Jesus Christ and his righteousness is to be our priority. Because our aim in life, our goal in life is to be Jesus Christ, because this is not our home. We're just passing through. Everything we can do this side of heaven is temporary, but Jesus in heaven is eternal. It makes me think of Moses. I love it in Romans or in Hebrews 11:24. It tells us that by faith, because he believed, by faith when he became of age, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You have to understand, being called Pharaoh's daughter was having the riches of the world at your fingertips. He had all the money, all the jewels, all the women, all the, the anything he wanted at his fingertips. But he refused that, choosing rather, in verse 25, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Verses, verse 26, he says, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt for he looked to the reward by faith he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured as seeing him who is invisible he endured this life as he kept his eyes on the king of kings and the lord of lords well back to Philippians 3:12 where we see Paul's humility and his commitment as he goes on to say not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I wonder how much Moses's testimony played in to to Paul having that that attitude of laying hold of Jesus Christ. But the thing that really stuck out to me in verse 12 this week was that why did Christ lay hold of you? Why did Christ lay hold of me? 
In other words, what is my purpose in this life? And while he has a different purpose for each of us individually, as we're all different parts of the body of Christ, in a broad sense, we all have the same purpose as Moses. In Exodus 9, 16, listen to what God said to Moses. He said, but indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all of the earth. That is our purpose. We exist to show God's power and to declare his name to all the earth. And his purpose for all of us also includes suffering, as we've seen, because his glory and suffering go hand in hand. Romans 8, 16 tells us that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Because suffering is what conforms us into his image. We have to go to Calvary before we can go to Pentecost. I love that. Yet no matter, well, actually, I don't love that. I hate that. I don't want to go to Calvary. I want to skip Calvary and go right to Pentecost. But no matter the individual purpose that God has laid hold of us for, his purpose for our life, regardless what that brings, we know, according to Romans 8, 28, that, that all things will work together for good for those who love him and that are, are called according to his purpose. Back to Philippians 3.13. Paul continues, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, showing his humility and knowing that he's not perfect. But one thing I do, I like this. The most important thing I do is forget those things which are behind. Oh, ladies, if we could forget the things which were behind us. Unfortunately, our minds are traps and it can be good and it can be bad. Whatever we allow in, whatever has happened to us, it will stay. And again, that can be good or bad. And every day we must make that choice. What are we going to allow into our minds? Paul here is saying, as we are believers, we need to forget everything that we have done. And we have to forget what has been done to us. We need to allow it to go under the blood of Christ so that he can wash it clean. And as we remember what Christ has done for us and that he has washed us clean, it will cause us to press into him all the more. God tells us in Isaiah 43, 18, now you have to understand this is speaking of when he parted the Red Sea. And he's telling God, his people in Isaiah 43, 18 to forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past, even the good things of the past, other than to remember how great God is. But then he goes on and says, see, I, the Lord, am doing a new thing. And now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? You see, we can't see what's in front of us if we're constantly looking backwards. We've got to forget what is behind us because he's making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. So verse 13, Paul forgets the things that are behind him. There's no chance he wants to turn back to his old life and turn back from following Jesus. So then he says, I am reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Paul says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Absolutely one of my all-time favorite verses because I have to remind myself of that all the time. I've been spending a lot of time with my grandkids. And the three-year-old and the six-year-old love to play with imagination. So we have a little two-block um, slump stone wall around the, the yard. And of course, unless you're on the wall, you're in hot lava. So I have to climb up on that little wall and we have to walk around the whole property on this little two, two step, you know, it's about this high block wall. Well, I'm old and it's been a long time since I've been in gymnastics. So I take a little Ren's hand and I said, okay, let's go. We got to stay out of the lava. But what came back to me from gymnastics a million years ago and 500 pounds ago uh, was that when I was on the beam, I had to look forward. You can't look down at your feet. You have to look forward. You have to look up. You have to find the point way out there and you're golden. You're not going to fall. 
the minute you look down, you're going to lose your balance and you're going to fall off that beam or that block wall. And so we can't look down. We can't look to the side. We can't look behind. We must look forward. And I thought, you know, that, that just really came to me because it's that way in the physical realm as well as the spiritual realm. And in Philippians 3.15, now Paul exhorts believers to walk in unity. But I love, we're going to see how that comes with putting on the mind of Christ, focusing on our upward call. Now remember, walking was the theme in the book of Ephesians, where we saw that we were to walk in how we were to walk in life, how we were to walk in love, walk circumspectly or soberly, to walk in good works, to walk worthy of our calling, to walk as children of the light. And then look at verse 15 of Philippians 3. It says, therefore, as we forget the past and press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God with eternity with God in view, let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if anything you think, if, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you because his spirit is able to speak to us. We don't have to go around and beat each other up because they're not doing what's right. We can trust that the spirit of the living God will reveal things to other people in, their, in his time. Verse 16, nevertheless, to the degree, degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. We have not only Jesus Christ who came to be an example for us, but we have all the apostles, we have the prophets, we have the word of God that is so full of good examples for us that have finished their race well, who have gone across the finish line. And for you and I today, we, we have sisters in Christ that we can look to, but we don't look to them as heavily as we do those who have already finished their race because we need to make sure that we finish our race well and we don't get sidetracked. Well, verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. Paul was grieved that they are enemies of the Christ, the cross of Christ. Now this seems to be speaking of the believers like in Corinth who used the grace of God to indulge their flesh, giving the legalist even more ammo against the church. Isn't that what happens today? You hear people say, oh, don't teach too much grace because that just causes people to sin. So we've got to bring in the law and say, do this and don't do this because they don't understand the real grace of God, but it gives both sides ammo because then when you start bringing in the law, it causes rebellion and then they start going into licentiousness. So Jesus and his word is, cent is centrist. Yet notice they were weren't counted as Paul's enemies. I love this. You see, Paul didn't make this about himself. He didn't take it personal when people weren't following accurate doctrine. He could have, but he said they were enemies of the cross because they were cheapening the work of Jesus on the cross. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, whose set their mind on earthly things. Here we go back to what we set our mind on, what we fix our view on, not down here, but we have to keep it up here. So the believers in Philippi were not only be, being pursued by the legalists, but they were being pursued and pulled down by those who were living in sin. They were all trying to pull people away because that's what Satan does. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to get our focus off that upward call. And, and sometimes we have the, they have the appearance of godliness, but there's no substance because it's, it's not the true word of God. And it's nothing new. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 3. In verse 1, he says, oh, foolish Galatians. And he's uh, speaking of the legalists that were creeping into the church, the Judaizers. He said, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? For whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish 
having begun in the spirit, you're now being made perfect by the flesh. Verse five, therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And then he says, just as Abraham believing, believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Remember before the covenant of circumcision, therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would uh, justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nation shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Wow. So it's by faith. Then verse 20, I love this, for our citizenship is in heaven. We are just strangers passing through this land. This would have had a huge meaning to the people in Philippi because remember, it was a Roman colony. And while they were far from Rome, they valued their Roman citizenship. Just like for you and I, we are heavenly citizens. And though we're far from heaven in some respects, we value, we greatly value our heavenly citizenship. Verse 20, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. Ladies, do you know how big our God is? He's om omnipotent, meaning that he is all powerful. He is the most powerful. He created all things just by a spoken word. He saved us, sent his son. Nothing can come close to matching his power as he alone is able to subdue all things. And as I thought about that, I thought, is there something in our lives that we need Jesus to come and subdue? I know there is because I know there's things in my life Maybe you need to have some things subdued in your life like fear. How about bitterness? How about unforgiveness? How about self-indulgence? Maybe it's laziness. Maybe a lack of compassion. Whatever it is, God is able to subdue it if you give it to him. And then it can be in your past and you can look forward towards that upward call. And just because of who God is, because he's given us that living hope, because he's able to sustain us through the most difficult season this side of heaven. In Romans 6, 4, Paul tells us that we should walk in the newness of life. Because if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, if we're willing to die to ourself, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. You see, God's made it really simple. Now, it is impossible, but nonetheless, it's simple. But it's only simple if we die to self. Paul is the one that wrote, I have been crucified with Christ it is not, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And in Galatians 2.21, it says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. It's all about dying to self and putting on the mind of Christ. And that's when we will serve one another, forgive one another, love one another, and it will result in unity because that is the fruit that the root produces as we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Ladies, I, I say this all the time, but it is true. Time is short. And so let's remember and keep in the forefront of our mind that we've all been created for a purpose, for God's purpose, to show God's power and to declare his name in all the earth. Or we could say we have been created to know him and make him known. And as we exchange our self-sufficient achieve achievements for the grace of God, it's the only thing that will matter in the day that we take our final breath 
is that we had faith in Jesus and his righteousness. C.T. Studd, Pastor Chuck used to uh, quote this all the time, and I love it because it's so true. He says, we only have one life that will soon be passed, and only what we do for Christ will last. And I want you to really think on that quote. Allow it to, don't allow it to be a cute little saying, a cute little rhyme. But as you go through your day, meditate on how it is God who will work in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Because we only have one life and it will soon be passed. Only what we do for Christ will last. And when we put our faith in Jesus, we can have joy in believing. We can have joy in in the faith of what is to come. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to come together to look at your word, to be reminded that we need to keep our eyes fixed upon the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We need to be reminded that it's not by works, but it's by faith. Lord, we need to be reminded that it's nothing that we can do, but it's everything that you've already done. And as we put our faith in you, regardless of our circumstances, and I know there's many, we can have joy. We can rejoice in the midst of all of it. So Lord, help us. Help us to give you the things that need to be subdued in our lives. Lord, it's different for all of us, but God, you know, and I pray you would reach into the heart of each and every one of us and reveal to us what needs to be subdued. And then help us, give us the the grace to be able to hand it over to you once for all, never to pick it up again. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that you bring to our lives. And we praise you and we thank you. And God, I just pray you would bless these ladies, that they would have joy in serving their families. They would have joy in serving you. They would have joy even when they're alone. If they have no one in their home with them, they can have joy as they they meditate upon you and they can praise you and worship you. Lord, we're just getting fit for heaven and I thank you so much for that. And it's in Jesus Christ's most precious name that we all pray and all of God's ladies say, amen. God bless you guys.